started, uh, firstly, just to welcome you to uh, Physics 213, second semester general physics. My name's Tim Gorringe, so I'll be teaching the, I'll be the instructor for the lecture classes. Uh, you'll meet your lab instructors and recitation instructors over the next um, uh, week or so. We're kind of a team because there's different components to the course, different pieces to the course. Um, and so feel free, you know, if questions come up or issues come up, to contact any of us that are working um, in, in either your, in the lecture or the, the recitation or, or, or the lab. So my office is in this building. It's, it's room three, 309. So you can find me there. It's, um, it's basically above the bagels, um, or just <laughs> close to above the bagels at the, in, in the food court. Um, my email, this is the best email for me, timgorringe at uky.edu. So um, if you've got questions, it's best to send them there. Um, I don't always immediately see them if you send them through Canvas, although they do kind of percolate there. Um, but this is, this is probably the, the best email for me. I post in my office hours here. If, you, if those don't work, you can always make appointments or drop by at other times. That's, that's perfectly fine. Any questions on all that? Okay. So what I wanted to do today is uh, a few things. I wanted to just walk through the organization of the class. I wanted to give you a, a brief introduction to the course in general. And then I wanted to give you uh, a longer introduction to electricity, which is the first sort of theme or, or first topic of the class. So, so that's the plan for today. So I'm going to start with just organization things. Um, if you've got questions, stop, stop me. I'll try and answer your questions on the organization, or, or um, I'll check in at the end of working through the organization if you've got any questions then. Okay. So what, what you need for the class, the materials you need for the class, or the access you need for the class, is firstly, firstly Canvas. And of course, I'm sure you, you, you all have Canvas. Um, um, you could not have it. Um, for this particular class, you need access to our textbook, which is Survey and Vool, General Physics, uh, because we'll be working from material in that textbook. And you'll need access to WebAssign homeworks, because we'll be working with um, uh, problems, questions from WebAssign homework. So those are the three things you need. I, I think the most economic way to get the latter two things here, the, the access to the textbook and the access to the uh, homework, is, um, is through this uh, first day program. So I think there you can get these two items for $44. You're getting electronic access to the textbook. You're not getting a physical textbook. If you wanted a physical textbook, if you tried to buy version 11, edition 11, that, that's pretty expensive. But actually, older versions, if you can get them second hand, the further you go back in time, the cheaper they get. They're all perfectly fine in terms of the material. It's just that the numbers of the problems won't match the numbers in the WebAssign homeworks, but that doesn't really matter anyway. So what I'm trying to say is that if you're happy with the electronic version of the textbook, that's perfectly fine. If you want to get a hard copy textbook, you might want to look at um, uh, second-hand copies of older editions. OK. There's two cycles in the class that I want to talk about. One is a weekly cycle. Um, and then a second one is a cycle between three tests that we'll have. So here I try to picture the cycle that's going to go on every week for the length of the semester. 
except a little bit, this is a funny week because we're starting, and next week is a little bit of a funny week because we, don't, we have uh, Martin Luther King Day on Monday. Um, but every other week will be exactly this, this cycle. So I picked a week that's two weeks ahead from now. So this will be a regular homework, recitation, lecture cycle. So actually it starts next week and ends two weeks away. So next, next Tuesday's lecture will introduce some material. And every lecture, there'll be a concept quiz. Next, Wednesday, next Thursday's lecture will introduce some more material. And there'll be a concept quiz in lecture on that. And then the material from next Tuesday's lecture and next Thursday's lecture will be the subject of the recitation class on the following Monday. And in that recitation class, you'll get the opportunity to ask questions and work through the homework problems associated with the Tuesday lecture class and the Wednesday lecture class. And, and you'll have a, um, a homework problem uh, assigned for collection at the end of that class. You'll also have the complete web assigned homework set due that night, at, at midnight that evening on that Monday. And so this is really the cycle of the lectures and the recitations and the assignments that will go on week after week after week. So as I say, this week and next week is a little bit special. Um, this week we'll have a couple of lecture quizzes, but they won't count for credit. That's just so that we get all on board taking the lecture quizzes. Next week you won't have a recitation which is unfortunate. Um, uh, but you won't have a recitation, but I would definitely, there is a homework assignment. It won't be for credit, but I would definitely recommend doing that. And then after that, we get on the regular cycle, this regular weekly cycle. So I tried to summarize the course grading in terms of all the course assignments in this little table here. Now, I put details for tests and lecture quizzes and recitations and web assigned homeworks. You'll hear more on how the lab works, how the lab is graded from your um, lab instructors. Anyway, these are the classes of assignments over the duration of the semester. There's going to be three tests, and these are the three dates of the tests, two in the semester and one at the end of the semester. Every lecture, there'll be a, um, a lecture quiz, mostly multiple choice, maybe a, some true force lecture quizzes. Um, and so that's every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, every Monday, starting that January 23rd, so not next Monday, but the following Monday. Um, you, for credit, you'll submit your solutions to the web assigned homework. So it's numerical solutions to the web assigned homeworks. And every Monday in your recitation, again, not next Monday, but starting the Monday after that, you'll submit a fully worked out problem uh, from that homework at the end of your recitation class. So. In this little table here, this is in the syllabus, but I, I, I reproduced it here on the slide. This is the, um, this is the list of assignments, and this is um, the, how, how many points they're worth in computing your final grade. So here are the three tests. Here's your lecture quizzes for the entire semester, 10%. Here's your recitation problems, 10%. Here's your web assigned homeworks, 10% for the entire semester. And down here is your lecture, uh, lab grade. So we'll work on a 15-point scale for the assignment of letter grades. So that means that if you get 85% or above, that's an A. 70% or above, that's a B, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, last slide, and 
organization. So I mentioned that there's this weekly cycle, um, but there's also, over the course of the semester, there's kind of three themes or um, three to major topics to the course. There's um, electricity, magnetism, and then there's the last one, which is really matter, light, space, and time. And um, corresponding to those three themes, there'll be three tests. Um, on here, I've kind of reproduced a portion of a table in the syllabus which lists each lecture class, the topics of each lecture class, and how they build up to the tests. So this is the lecture classes that lead to test one, which is in early in February, February 9th. And so this is the material that we're going to cover on electricity over the, the, the next uh, 10 or so lectures to lead up to test one. And then if you look in the syllabus, you'll see a similar thing for the um, topic or the theme on magnetism, say 10 lectures and then a test. And then you'll see the same sort of thing for the topic or the theme on light, matter, space, time. Uh, there's a couple more lectures there, maybe 12, 12 or so lectures there. Any questions on the organization? When there's no questions, you know that means that either it's extremely clear or it's so, so unclear that you can't even imagine a question. So this, it's, all I know is it's one of those two things right now. Okay. So I've got a one slide overview of the uh, entire course, just to give you a, a, a sort of general perspective on what we're going to be doing, what we're going to be learning over the semester. And then I'll move on to our introduction to the first, first module or the first theme, which is electricity. Okay, so the first thing we're going to be talking about is electricity. So why might electricity be interesting? Why might electricity be important? Well, there's a number of reasons for that, that it's interesting and that it, it's in, important. Um, one reason is that everything, all matter, you and I, we're all you know, made of electrical pieces parts, constituents. Atoms and the ingredients in atoms are electrical. And so that's one reason that we're all made up of electrical building blocks. Um, another reason might be that, for example, if think about, uh, I selfishly think about myself, um, my heart, my brain, your heart, your brain, they're electrical devices. And so that's another reason we might be interested in how electricity works. You know, even you know, when I stand here and I'm afraid because there's 180 of you, or when test one's coming up and you're afraid because you don't know what's going to happen, um, that, that emotion, that fear, that's electrical ultimately. And all our emotions uh, are uh, electrical ultimately. And so we, we are living in an electrical world and we are electrical beings basically. So that's one reason it might be interesting. So that's the first theme, up to test one. Uh, second theme is, um, is magnetism. So why, why might, be, might we be interested in magnetism? So you might know that, you probably know, that Earth is a magnet. Earth is a huge magnet. And that's not really just a curiosity that Earth is a magnet, um, but it's important that Earth is a magnet because Earth's magnetism 
actually shields us from cosmic radiation. And without that shield, we wouldn't survive. And so one reason we're interested in magnetism is because the Earth is a magnet. That's interesting. But also because that magnet saves our lives. We wouldn't be able to survive in, without the umbrella of the um, uh, magnetism of the Earth to shield us from the cosmic radiation. Another reason that um, magnetism is important is that many of the inventions uh, that make our modern day lives easy and comfortable and so on and so forth are, are inventions based on understanding of, of magnetism. So things like electrical generators, right? We don't have to sit here with oil lamps. We've got, you know, we've got electricity comes from electrical generators and um, those electricity, that, that electrical generation is based on understanding magnetism. Same for electrical motors, that's based on understanding magnetism. S same as like all the data that's stored on YouTube and Twitter and whatever, that's all stored magnetically. And so, so much of our modern lives in, is based on understanding magnetism. So that's a reason that we might be interested in that. So that's the second theme or second module leading up to test two. And then finally there's light, space, time, matter. So the interesting thing about light, the intriguing discovery about light is that it was realized that electricity, theme one, and magnetism, theme two, are not actually two separate phenomena. Electricity and magnetism are just two different faces, two different facets of a common force we call electromagnetism. And when electricity and magnetism were joined into electromagnetism, it led to a remarkable sort of earth-shattering sh earth in the you know, scientific sense um, prediction. It predicted light. It predicted the existence of light. Suddenly at that point we understood what light was. And so intellectually light is interesting as the most famous prediction of electricity and magnetism. Light of course is also interesting. Now we understand that light is a feature of a, a electricity and magnetism. Um, light, light is interesting because um, it's the sun's sunlight. That's the reason we live and survive. It carries to us, it carries to Earth energy. The sunlight carries energy and that's the energy we need to survive on Earth. And so that's another reason that, that light is important. So finally, once we've understood electricity, magnetism, and light, so kind of electromagnetism, we'll, we'll turn that understanding, we'll turn it on to, firstly, space and time, and then we'll turn it on to matter and material. And we'll see that with this new understanding of electricity, magnetism, and light, we'll uncover a new reality of space and time. It's not what you think it is. And a new reality of matter, material. It's also not what you think it is. Um, and so our final module includes kind of this use of electricity, magnetism, and, and light to look again at our environment of space, time, and matter and get a better understanding. It's kind of a weirder understanding of space, time, and matter. So that's the final, final topic. And that will be test three at the end of the semester. Any, any questions on all that? Okay. So now I'm going to, I mean, then 
then I'm going to start the class. Uh, I'm going to start talking about electricity. I'm going to start the introduction on electricity. Um, this lecture class doesn't, doesn't have any equations, doesn't have any calculations. In, in that sense, I'm mis misrepresenting the, the remainder of the semester because in the, the remaining lecture classes, we'll be dealing with um, not only ideas and concepts and notions, but equations and formulas and calculations. But anyway, to get us going, this is a more um, conceptual, um, more sort of ideas-based class. So I want to talk about the discovery of a electrical attraction and electrical repulsion. It, it's a 2,000 year long discovery of those two things. I want to talk about um, the understanding of electrical attraction, electrical repulsion, in terms of the idea, the notion of electric charge. It's very important. Then I want to talk about um, the world around us, the electrical world around us, where there are actually two types of materials, fundamentally. There's and you know these names, there's types of materials that are conductors and there's types of materials that are insulators. So I'll talk about that. And then finally, this last topic here, this is really where I'm going to build on what we've learned about attraction and repulsion, about positive and negative charges, about insulators and conductors with some examples. I'm going to talk about some important instruments for working with electricity. And I'm going to talk about some important ways you can uh, electrically charge things in, in electricity. OK, so if you think about dogs and cats, you think about um, husbands and wives, uh, there's both attraction and repulsion some of the time. And so um, we're going to talk about uh, electrical attraction and repulsion. Uh, and, and see how that, those ideas of electrical attraction and repulsion emerged. Okay, so on this slide, I tried to summarize the, the path, the road to understanding, discovering, finding that there's electrical attraction and electrical repulsion. So it all started um, this is more than two and a half thousand years ago. If you remember those ancient Greeks, um, uh, the, that ancient Greek civilization for the first time had people that they called philosophers that went around thinking about things. Um, they come up with all sorts of things from politics to ethics to whatever. They also noted a interesting phenomena effect. They noticed that a material called amber, so they made jewelry from amber, if you rub it, um, it can pick up things like, um, light things like straw or hair or feathers or dust. So that was an interesting observation, and they were first to write it down. They were first to note it. Now, I'm not saying that they were first to observe it or see it, but they were, it was the earliest record of it being um, noted or documented. And there it sat for like 2,000 years until a English pensioner, you know, working in his living room, um, uncovered the next step in the story of electricity. What he found was it's not just they thought that amber was special in attracting straw and feathers and, and hair. But it, amber wasn't special in attracting straw, feathers, and hair. In fact, it's not even that great at attracting straw, feathers, and hair. What William Gilbert found was that lots of materials, lots of materials, if you rub them, will attract, say, straw, feathers, or hair. And so that was a big breakthrough. Maybe it doesn't sound like a big breakthrough, but it was a big breakthrough in the sense that it was a realization that this electricity, we now call it, is, is 
something that all materials can exhibit. It's not just that special amber that got used in a bit of jewelry. Next big step. So Dufay was, I, I think he was like a French nobleman, so not a pensioner. Um, but he, he concluded a very important result in the history of electricity. And it, it's that there's not just electrical attraction when you rub objects. They don't just attract hair and feathers and, and straw. There's also, as well as electrical attraction, there's electrical repulsion. So this was a massive breakthrough. That here was a interaction that both uh, was attractive and repulsive in different circumstances. What he went on to conclude, and, he, and an example of it is the following. If you take two glass rods and rub them, they will repel one another. And I'll show you this. If you take two plastic rubber rods and rub those, they will repel one another. I'll show you that. But if you take a glass rod and a plastic rod, two different, these different materials, they, they will attract one another. So he concluded that there's two types of materials. There's glass-like materials and plastic-like materials. And like materials will repel one another. They push each other apart. And um, unlike materials will attract one another. They pull each other together. And that was, that was a huge breakthrough. So I'm going to show you, for this, I'm going to show you a few demonstrations today up here. For this one, I think I'm going to show you a video. Because this one is, you've got to be really careful. I'm not a really careful person. Um, so I don't want it to go, go wrong. So I'm going to show you a video where I did this one. And then we'll, we'll do the other electrostatic demonstrations uh, up front here. So what you're going to see in the video is the other reason I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it in the video is we had two glass rods. And we had two plastic rods, but I lost one of them. So I can't show half of it anymore. Um, but these are the glass rods, and I can rub these with fur, cat fur here, or uh, silk. And here's a plastic rod, and we can rub this. And then we're going to investigate the attractions and repulsions between these different rods. And, and this is the beginning of electricity. So, so let me show you this. So the, the first thing you're going to see is the repulsion from two glass rods. So look out for that. Then you're going to see the repulsion from two plastic rods. Look out for that. So those are like materials repelling one another. And then you're going to see the attraction between a glass rod and a plastic rod. So that's um, unlike materials attracting one another. And so that's the basic spectrum of electricity. So here's a, a glass rod rubbed with cat's fur. And I put it on there on this little turntable so it's really easy to move. And so it'll be, it'll be really easy to see attraction or repulsion. Then I bring this guy up next to it. Look, I'm not touching it, honest. And it just runs away from the other glass rod. I mean, when you think about that, that's remarkable. I just rubbed them with cat's fur, and they repelled one another. I'm going to do the same thing with the plastic rods. Here's the one that I lost, I think. Yeah. That's the one I lost. And here's the one I still have. So I'm rubbing them with the cat's fur. And now let's see what happens. Again, the rod on the turntable is repelled by the rod in my hand. I did not touch them. So that's another example of like 
like objects repelling one another. And now, the th sort of, this is the final masterpiece of this video. Um, we're going to have the plastic rod, and we're going to have the glass rod. I'm rubbing both of these. And now you see the attraction. And look, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not touching anything. There's no contact. And I've got, a, got electrical attraction. And so, in that two minutes, less than two minutes, I come and summarize two and a half thousand years of history of um, uh, work with electricity to the point where we discovered that if you rub materials, you can expose this electrical influence that can be either attractive or repulsive, depending on circumstances. I want to give a more modern day explanation to the electrical attraction and electrical repulsion in terms of electrical charges. I'm sure you've heard of electrical charges. But let's see how electrical charges, positive, negative electrical charges, explain the attraction and repulsion. So I want to make a few remarks in explaining the attraction and repulsion through negative and positive charges. A few, few remarks about the nature of matter, about the effects of, of rubbing with you know, the, the silk or the fur or the whatever, um, and ultimately about the origins of the attraction and, and repulsion. <clears throat> I don't know if you know this or not, but the idea, the concept of charges, positive and negative charges, were due to Benjamin Franklin. So you know Benjamin Franklin because um, I, I'm English, so I, I hate to say all this. But he's, he signed the Declaration of Independence. He drafted the Declaration of Independence. Um, he was also a very famous scientist. And um, he was the person that came up with this concept we're talking about now of um, electrical charge, positive and negative charges. So they had a, a huge role in the history, the understanding of ele electricity. So look, nowadays we understand that the glass rod, the plastic rod, the fur, the silk, they're all made of atoms and molecules. And nowadays we understand that those atoms and molecules are made of electrons and protons and neutrons. And nowadays we understand that the electrons carry negative charge electrical charge, a property, a characteristic called electrical charge, and protons carry positive charge. Again, a intrinsic property or characteristic we call um, uh, charge. It's interesting that the, um, and important that the charge of an electron, here it is, uh, minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, is equal and opposite the charge of a proton, which is plus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Coulombs. So that's a modern day picture that matter, material, and you and I are made up of charged ingredients. So when you rub a, a plastic rod with fur, or you rub a glass rod with uh, silk, what's going on? What's going on? is actually you're transferring electrons from one of the materials to the other material. One of the materials has a greater affinity, kind of preference, for electrons. One of them has a lesser affinity or preference from electrons. And when you start rubbing plastic with fur or glass with silk, 
you're scraping off electrons from one material onto the other material. Now, before you did the rub rubbing of the glass rod or the rubbing of the um, uh, plastic rod, the, the plastic, the glass, the silk, the fur had equal numbers of, el of electrons and, posit uh, and protons. So overall, they were what we call neutral, no net charge. But when you transfer electrons from the glass to the silk or the fur to the plastic, then they don't have equal numbers of uh, electrons and protons. One has an excess of negative charge, one has an excess of positive charge. You've made them charge by scraping charged particles from one material to another material. And so that's a modern understanding of what we're doing when we're rubbing glass with silk or rubbing plastic with fur. That's how they get charged. The attraction and repulsion of light materials or unlight materials is really a reflection of the fact that uh, like charges, so two negative charges, repel one another, or two positive charges repel one another. Unlike charges, so a plus charge and a minus charge, or a minus charge and a plus charge, they attract one another. So that discovery, finding of electrical, and repulsion, electrical attraction and repulsion of light materials and unlight materials is really a finding that um, light charges repel one another, two pluses repel one another, two minuses repel one another, unlike charges attract one another, a plus and a minus and a minus and a plus one uh, will attract one another. And actually, the assigning of pluses and minuses is a very neat way of mathematically encoding that attraction and repulsion. Plus times plus is a plus. Minus times minus is a plus. That's plus is repulsion. Plus times minus is a minus. Minus times plus is a minus. That's attraction. That's how mathematically the positive and negative charges lead to attraction and repulsion. And that's all due to Benjamin Franklin. Okay, here's just a little cartoon of that. So this is a cartoon to go with a little video. We saw in the little video the attraction and repulsion of like and unlike charged objects. Here's the explanation in terms of the underlying charges of the microscopic subatomic constituents of the materials of the glass and the plastic, the fur and the silk. So here, here I am rubbing the glass rod with silk and I'm stripping electrons off the glass and onto the silk. Here I am demonstrating the attraction of unlike materials. Here I am demonstrating the repulsion of light materials. So this is glass and rubber on the left, this is rubber and rubber on the right. The attraction is ultimately due to the attraction between these unlike charges, a negative and a positive. That's attractive. The repulsion is ultimately due to this repulsion between like charges, in this case two minuses, could be two pluses. And so that's the microscopic understanding of the discovery by Dufay of attraction and repulsion of like objects, unlike objects. That's a big breakthrough. Okay, so I wanted to do a concept quiz so that we could all practice a concept quiz. So you'll know a bit what a concept quiz is about. Also, I'll, I'll try and learn how to um, uh, assign the concept quiz, so that would be another bit of practice too. Um, so I'm going to post this in Canvas.
So normally I, I would give you, I don't know, a few minutes for this, because I'm a meanie. Um, I'll give you five minutes for it, because it's the first one. But the idea is it's just a little question, just a little concept question on the material that I've, I've just discussed. And so I'm hoping that you see this question. Let me, let me know if you don't see this question. But the fact that um, it's all quiet, I think it's probably that you do see it. Um, it's about attraction and repulsion and the interpretation of attraction and repulsion in terms of uh, electrical charges. So I'll give you a few minutes to, to answer that. And then, um, then, we'll, then we'll move on. Okay, um, so this is a question about rubbing a glass rod with silk. As I say, the glass rod and the silk initially have equal numbers of positive and negative constituents, electrons and protons. When you rub the glass with the silk, you transfer electrons from one material to the other material. If you're transferring electrons from one material to the other material, one has then an excess of electrons, one has a, um, a, a deficit of electrons. So one becomes negatively charged, the one with the excess of electrons, one becomes positively charged, the one with the deficit of electrons. So they have unlike charges, one's positive, one's negative. Unlike charges, we heard from Benjamin Franklin, attract one another. And so the silk and the glass will attract one another because they have opposite, unlike charges. So that's, that's the answer to that. So next, starting next week, you'll get credit for these quizzes. Uh, if you get a correct answer, that's t two points. And if you get a, uh, an incorrect answer, that's, that's one point. And so that's how the, um, um, the grading will run through the semester. And um, I'll say a little bit more about that grading of the quizzes when we, we start for real. OK. Look, we, we've um, actually just uncovered a remarkable thing. In first semester general physics, you met a few fundamental dimensions of nature. So you met uh, space, and you met time, and um, you met mass, matter. Those are fundamental dimensions of nature. Um, all the other quantities that you met in first semester general physics, things like energy and momentum, are built out of those fundamental dimensions. So that entire course, if I, if I wanted to trivialize it, <laughs> um, I don't. Um, but it's, it's just about three dimensions of nature, space, time, and, and mass. We've just found, in the first half of the first class, a new uh, second semester, a new dimension of nature it's electrical charge. 
So that's a very important discovery. And um, that's, that's why I'm a big fan of Lady Gaga. That's why she, when she comes to class, there's something big in the because she can't always come. But th this is a big discovery. So s now space-time, mass, and charge are our new fundamental dimensions of nature that we're going to be working with. So that's, in a way, that's the difference between first semester and second semester general physics is the fundamental dimensions of nature. We've now got four, they only had three. Um, and the whole semester is going to be about that. Um, if you want to think about fundamental dimensions of nature, I think of them like as the, you know, in home baking you need flour and you need eggs and you need milk and salt. They're the fundamental dimensions of baking out of which you can bake all sorts of cakes and things like that. Um, so space, time, mass, and charge are the fundamental dimensions of, of this class out of which we're going to build everything. I wanted to make a final remark that it's not just positive and negative charge objects that can repel or attract one another. But actually, a positively charged object will attract a neutral object. Or a negatively charged object will attract a neutral object. Now, at first sight, that might sound ridiculous. I just said that charge is due to charge that you get electrical attractions and repulsions. So why can a charged object attract a neutral object? It's because the charged object is attracting a neutral object that has inside it lots of charged bits and pieces, the electrons and protons. So new charged objects can attract neutral objects. Let me try and demonstrate that. Um, I'm going to put a camera on for this. I don't know that it will help. So this is going to be this piece of PVC pipe from home. It's going to be my, um, uh, my charge object. I'm going to rub this and make this charge. This 2 by 4 is also from home. This is going to be my uncharged object. I'm not going to try and rub the 2 by 4 So I'm going to rub this guy, try and charge it up. And then we're going to see if we can attract the neutral 2 by 4 I'm not t If you're near the front, you can see that I'm not touching it. But I literally am pulling a 2 by 4 with a little piece of plastic pipe that I rub. So this is a charged object. That is a neutral object. So that's how powerful electricity is. I'll show you one more demonstration. I'm showing you two here because the wood is an insulator. The Coke can, Diet Coke, that's a, that's a conductor. Let's see if I can um, uh, attract a conductor. I'm, I'm going to come back to insulators and conductors later, but I wanted to show you these two. Come on. Um, whoa. <laughs> so again, I can attract a neutral Coke can with the charged PVC pipe because the neutral Coke can inside it has charged ingredients. The 2 by 4 inside it had charged ingredients. That's why that works. So that's like a discovery of a whole electrical world. As I say, you, I, and everything on the desk is electrical. 
And the way we work is electrical. And so we're uncovering that world. This slide here just shows you a little bit of detail, uh, a little more detail, on why a, a charged object can attract a neutral object. So on this slide here, there's a charged object on the, on the left. So this is the PVC pipe. And then there's a neutral object over here on the, um, on the right. So this is the 2 by 4 or this is the uh, uh, Diet Coke can. This, when we say that this is charged on the left, what we mean is it's got an excess, in this case, of negative charge. When we say that this is neutral on the right, what we mean is not that it doesn't have any charge in it. It's built of charge constituents, but it's got equal numbers of pluses and minuses, equal numbers of electrons and protons. The presence of the negative charge over here actually attracts the positive charges in the neutral object. So they're pulled a little bit towards the left, and it actually repels the negative charges. They're pushed a little bit towards the right. So what happens is that when you bring the charged object to the neutral object, you're pulling the opposite charges a little bit closer. You're pushing the same sign charges a little bit further away. And you get the attraction. It's telling us a very important thing, very interesting thing. You get the attraction if the strength of the force, the strength of the attraction or repulsion, gets, gets stronger the closer things get, or gets weaker the further things are apart. You see, we've, we've pulled the unlike charges closer to us. We push the like charges further away. We get attraction because the attraction of the unlike charges, which is nearer, are winning. The repulsion of the unlike charges, which are further away, they're losing. And so it's actually telling us that the force, the interaction, the attraction repulsion gets weaker with distance. And so it's not just the party trick. It's actually telling you something about the nature, the behavior, the properties of electrical forces. And we'll continue that story in, um, in Thursday's class. OK, so I wanted to mention conductors and insulators. The, the whole history of electricity is kind of interesting. So it started with the ancient Greeks, right? And then next two big things, discoveries, were from you know, two English pensioners working, you know, at, at their, in their living rooms, basically. Uh, one we met, Gilbert, discovered that you know, everything's electrical, basically. The other one, Stephen Gray, discovered that there's two classes of materials. One that can transport, carry electricity around. Nowadays, we say carry charge around, transport charge. And there's another class of material that can't carry electricity or charge around. And, um, can't, can't carry, yeah, can't carry those charges around. We call that insulated. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. So what Stephen Gray concluded was these two types of materials, conductors on the left, insulators on the right. Electric charge, in modern language, right, electric charge can flow through conductors under the influence of uh, electrical forces or electrical interactions. On the other hand, electric charge cannot flow through insulators. N no electrical force or electrical interaction will pull an electrical charge through an insulator. As, as exam famous examples of conductors and insulators. So for conductors, metals, of course, you know conductors. You knew that in um, preschool or whatever. Um, Seawater is another great example. A lot of... Um, 
Solutions are great examples of conductors. What about insulators? Well, you know, know these too. So plastic is a famous example of an insulator. Um, amber is, a, I guess, a famous example of an insulator. Glass is a famous example of an insulator. So these materials are all around us. When you, when you charge by rubbing a conductor, that charge, because it can flow through the conductor, will spread out. And we'll see some examples of that later. So charging a conductor is very different from charging an insulator because the charge will spread out. It will spread away from you. It won't accumulate. It won't build up. When you charge by rubbing an insulator, like the, the glass or the uh, plastic, then that charge remains at the location of the rubbing. It can't move around. It can't be transported around. So it actually accumulates. It does build up. And so that's why I was doing the demonstrations. You know, hold on. Why did he use glass? Why did he use plastic? Why didn't he use a piece of metal? This is the reason. I use glass and I use plastic because the charge will build up. If I tried to do this with an aluminum rod or a steel rod, the charge wouldn't build up. It would move away. I wouldn't be able to demonstrate it. So they're fundamentally different in in how charge can move or not through, move through an insulator conductor. Forgot about this point. So we have to thank Stephen Gray because Stephen Gray is like the grandfather of electrical technology. Without Stephen Gray's recognition of insulators and conductors, right? We would have none of our electrical devices. So he's the, the grandfather of electrical circuits. He's the grandfather of the uh, iPhone or whatever. And so he, he really st started that, that business. We should also appreciate, maybe, should also appreciate it's interesting that there are two types of materials. One that electrons can move through, and another that electrons don't move through. The an actual understanding of that is related to the nature of the quantum world. It's n related to quantum physics. And so there's no classical, everyday explanation of why there would be insulators, conductors. It's actually a quantum effect, a quantum physics effect. Okay, I wanted to, this is the last topic here, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, examples of what we've been discussing, attraction, repulsion, and also the positive and negative charges and the insulators and conductors um, by discussing a couple of um, devices that are important in studying electricity and a couple of um, ways in which you, methods in which you charge things uh, with electrical charge. As you could imagine, you know, if I was a scientist, I don't know, in the 1700s or whatever, this new, new thing, electricity, had been discovered. Uh, this new property charge had been discovered. What would you want to do as a scientist? Well, you'd want to get yourself hold of some charge and you would want to start experimenting with charge and you want to start measuring charge and so there was a push for devices that could collect charge or generate charge uh, accumulate charge and devices that could measure charge quantify charge so I want to introduce a couple of these devices I want to introduce them because we're going to use them is part of the reason so one's called this a generator, a Van de Graaff generator, is for accumulating or collecting charge. And one's called an electroscope, gold leaf electroscope, is for measuring or quantifying charge. So this is how we collect some charge, you know, rather than rubbing the, forever rubbing the PVC pipe or glass rod, we can collect some charge here. And this is how we measure and quantify that charge, where there's a lot of charge, where there's a small amount of charge, where there's no charge on this device here. So 
the electroscope works by mechanically rubbing a, um, a strip of material across another material and accumulating that charge. The electroscope works by, if you deposit charge on the electroscope, it's made of conductors. The charge spreads out on the electroscope. There's a solid rod here, but there's also a gold, uh, a gold leaf here, a very light metal here. And those two things will repel in a proportion that depends on the amount of charge. So it's a way of measuring charge from the deflection of the gold leaf. And so these are two fundamental devices. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you an example of um, charging by uh, induction, what we call charging by induction, using the, the Van de Graaff generator and the gold, uh, not a gold leaf, but an electroscope. Then I'm going to show you a second example, which will be charging by contact, uh, using the Van de Graaff generator and using the um, uh, electroscope to measure the charge. Uh, as I say, as an example of all the things we put together in today's class about um, traction, repulsion, uh, positive and negative charges, insulators, conductors. I stood here and completely forgot what I was trying to do. Um, here we are. So this is a, a, a Van de Graaff generator. So in this section of it is a, a belt, a material belt. And when I switch it on, that belt will move around, and that belt will scrape, and charge will be scraped off that belt and deposited on this conductor here. So this thing here, you, you look worried, but you shouldn't be, too, no, not too worried. Um, this thing will accumulate lots of charge. And so this is me collecting, accumulating electrical charge. Over here on the left-hand side, this is the electroscope. So this is a metal arm on what I can deposit charge. This is metal plate. And uh, there's a solid piece to this metal arm, but there's also, instead of a gold leaf, we've got this light aluminum arm here. And so if I deposit charge on this, that charge will spread out across the conductor. We said it doesn't, it doesn't accumulate, it spreads away. And we'll see the, the light arm deflect from the um, fixed arm. And so we're going to take a, a look at that. The first thing I'm going to show you is charging by induction. I'm going to, try and, I'm going to charge the electroscope by induction. What that means is charging without contact. And we'll see what happens. And then I'm going to show you charging by contact. When I charge the electroscope, then I'm going to contact the electroscope. And we'll see the similarities and the differences. OK, so I'm scraping the belt on something up inside that sphere. Charge is building up on that sphere right now. We can't see it, but sometimes you can hear it kind of crackle. So I'm going to pick some of that charge up. So, you know, the sphere on the Van de Graaff is metal. This sphere is metal. And the charge is spreading out over the two spheres. So now I've got, I've got charge on this. It's like a bucket, a weird sort of bucket that I'm carrying the charge around with. And now I'm going to approach the electroscope. Look at that arm on the electroscope, I'm like a magician. Uh, not really. Um, this is charging by induction. I'm not touching the electroscope. But what's happening? I've got lots of extra negative charge on this sphere here. That negative charge on that sphere here 
is in the neighborhood of this neutral electroscope. It's pushing the light charges away. The electrons are running down the electroscope onto the arms of the electroscope. And so this electroscope is being, um, it's char it is neutral, but its charge is being rearranged. And you can see that electrons have run down to the arms of the electroscope because it's re the repulsion. If I take this away, you see that arm goes back down. The electrons just go back to where they were happiest. And then if I bring up my negative charge again, it's pushing the electrons away and um, the, the arms repel. But again, important thing here with induction is if I, if I take this away, that arm goes back, basically, <laughs> goes back to where it was. Okay, so now I'm going to do, um, I'm going to make sure everything's neutral, so there's no trickery. Um, and now I'm going to show you charging by conduction. And the only difference in what I do will be, instead of getting near but not touching the electroscope, I'm going to actually get near and touch the electroscope. Okay, so again, I've, I'm running the belt. It's accumulating charge on the top sphere. And I'm going to bring this sphere up. Sometimes you see a little spark. Yeah, there was one. Um, that's lightning. And I'm charging up the sphere in my hand. You notice it's got an insulating handle. And I'm going to move that charge over towards the electroscope. And we see that deflection from induction. But now I'm going to touch the electroscope. Maybe I'll spread this all over the electroscope. And now look, that arm stays put because I literally transferred charge from this sphere onto the electroscope. And so that is charging, charging by contact rather than charging by induction. I could get rid of that charge. So what, was, what is this, like my magic wand? No, it's not my magic wand. This is a piece of metal wire that is connected to ground, to earth. If I touch the metal wire to the electroscope, it gives an opportunity for the excess charge on the electroscope to run away from itself. And it will run down the wire into the ground. And so that's what I'm doing there. Okay, I, it's a couple of things I might try and do. In the, I got five minutes, so I think I can probably do it. One thing I wanted to do is confess. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to do is just work through a couple more examples of concept questions. Um, because concept questions are going to come up um, weekly uh, in each lecture. Concept questions are going to be on the test. It's just we get used to sort of working through concept questions like we're going to have to get used to working through um, numerical, calculational problems. Anyway, confessions. So we've introduced attraction, repulsion of charges. We've introduced the notion, the concept of charges. Um, but there's lots of things that we don't know about electrical charge. And so these are still open questions. Right? These, we're still working on these questions. So this is not a finished story. Electricity, magnetism, light is not a finished story. Electricity turns out to be stronger than gravity. Actually, it's much, much stronger than gravity. It's stronger than gravity by, think of your scientific notion, 
10 to the power 40. That's a big number. And electricity is stronger than gravity by that number. The reason we notice gravity, because we're stuck to the Earth, and not electricity so much, is that electrical objects tend to be neutral and cancel each other's out. But the Earth is all mass, all that's attractive, doesn't cancel itself out. But ultimately, electricity is much, much, much weaker than gravity. We don't know why. There's no idea why. Um, I mentioned that um, electricity has attraction and repulsion. Gravity only has attraction. We have no clue whatsoever why that is. It's such a basic thing about electricity versus magnetism, and yet we have no clue why it is. So that's an unsolved puzzle. I, I mentioned the fact that the electron and the proton have equal-sized opposite sign charges. Nobody has any clue whatsoever why that is. It's a complete mystery. We don't know. Charge is never destroyed, never created. It's only transferred. We've looked at examples of transferring charge by rubbing, and um, that was realized also by Benjamin Franklin that charge is conserved. And we, st we don't understand that either. We don't know why it is that charge is conserved, that there's no creation production. Uh, creation and destruction of charge. And we ultimately don't understand why the dimension of nature we call charge exists. So there's lots of open questions here. Um, if you want, I, I, I don't know, a, um, a, a little homework project to work on. Any of these would be great to have the answers to. Okay. I'm going to go to the document camera. And in these last few minutes, uh, yeah, it really is the last few minutes, I, I'll answer, I don't know, one or two or three of these questions as examples of concept questions in, in physics. So the, the, look at that first question. It says that an object receives positive charge by rubbing. In rubbing, had protons been added or electrons been removed? So that's an interesting question, um, because objects contain el electrons and protons. Couldn't a positive charge be due to adding protons rather than removing electrons? The answer is no. Two reasons. Electrons, relatively, uh, are bound to, kind of glued to, materials very, very lightly. Protons are bound to the material, glued inside the material, much, much stronger by factors of scale of million. So it's much easier to transfer electrons than protons. Also, electrons are very, very light. Protons are much, much heavier by a factor of thousand. So that's another reason, kind of the inertia that it's much easier to transfer electrons than protons. So that, that's the answer to that question. Second question. Why do hospital workers wear conducting shoes, not rubber shoes, if they're working around oxygen equipment? Why would that be? Is it a sort of fashion statement by oxygen, oxygen workers? No, it's not. Um, so we said that a difference between conductors and insulators is the charge can move in the conductors um, spread out. Uh, it won't move or spread out in an insulator. So when you have rubber shoes on, you can build up charge on your rubber shoes by rubbing your shoes with the ground. You don't want to do that around oxygen equipment because a spark can start a fire or an explosion. So hospital workers around oxygen equipment will wear conducting shoes because if you scrape your shoes across the floor and you um, build up charge by rubbing, it spreads out. And you don't get sparks, and you don't start a fire, and you don't start an explosion. So that's the reason for that. One more. Would life be different 
if electrons were positive or, and protons were negative? So that's a very interesting question. And, and, and at first you might think, well, it could be completely different. Uh, everything would be completely upside down. But it would actually be no different. If you reverse the charges of electrons and protons, you still have opposite charges attracting. You still have light charges.